Take a seat. <coughs> so, as I mentioned earlier, this is the first meeting, the January meeting of the Ceylon College of Physicians. And then we've chosen cardiology as our topic for the month. And then we will have more cardiology related events happening in the coming few weeks as well, uh, coming few uh, weeks, uh, remaining weeks of this month. So I invite those in the audience, live audience, as well as the online audience to wait for the uh, specialty update. And, uh, and there is a, a peer learning from an overseas expert as well, all lined up. The information will be shared with you. So to introduce uh, today's college lecture, speaker for the college lecture, may I uh, invite Dr. Myrudin? Uh, this is- uh, Thank you, Dr. Arosh Adesanayaka. Our, the college lecture is done, will be done by Dr. Tamal Vitanage, he is a consultant cardiologist, University Hospital, General Sir John, John Kotalawla Defense University. Uh, he has uh, graduated from uh, University of Colombo and obtained MD Medicine from Postgraduate Institute of Medicine, University of Colombo in 2016, Aw awarded Dr. P.T. De Silva Gordon for Clinical Medicine at the MD Medicine Examination 2016. He obtained post MD training in general international cardiology at the Institute of Cardiology National Hospitals, Colombo, 2016-2019, and advanced training in general and international cardiology and cardiac CT at Nottingham University Hospital, UK, 2019-2021. He has also passed the cardiology specialist training examination conducted by the European Society of Cardiology in 2021 and he's appointed as consultant general and international cardiologist at University Hospital, Kotaravala Defense Academy since uh, September, 2021. May I now invite Dr. Tamal Vitanage to present his college lecture on nuances in chronic uh, coronary syndrome. Thank you, sir. And thank you for that very kind introduction. It's uh, an absolute pleasure and a privilege to be delivering the inaugural college lecture for 2022. And I thought I'll uh, discuss a topic that is relevant to uh, most of us physicians uh, and hence uh, the topic of chronic coronary syndrome. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm going to put a little bit of an adjective to my topic. So I'm going to discuss nuances in chronic coronary syndrome. Why am I going to discuss nuances? So let me first define the word. A nuance is a subtle distinction, difference, or variation. You can also look at it as a quality of something that is not easy to notice but may be important. So I'm going to talk about nuances in chronic coronary syndrome because chronic coronary syndrome is omnipresent. Everybody comes across it. And simply because of that, I think it has lost its glory. It has lost its uh, focus. And most of us tend to take it for granted, including us cardiologists, because uh, that seems to be uh, chronic coronary syndrome, syndrome seem to be uh, present everywhere. So in the process, we have lost uh, the appreciation of the subtleties and the nitty gritties of the syndrome in evaluation and its management. So let me uh, elaborate uh, further based on these subheadings. First of all, talking about chronic coronary syndrome per se, it's a new term coined by the European Society of Cardiology in its 2019 guidelines. Now, this is previously called stable ischemic heart disease or stable coronary artery disease. Uh, but the ESC essentially wanted to bring in this term to emphasize the importance of uh, uh, ischemic heart disease as a wide spectrum of disease or as a, as a big syndrome rather than just one pathology-centric uh, a single pathology-centric uh, disease, uh, such as atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. So this essentially encompasses different pathologies of coronary ischemia or myocardial ischemia and does not limit its uh, use to, uh, or does not limit the reference only to uh, atherosclerotic disease. And this is what, what I just mentioned. Um, we. We, traditionally, we are traditionally used to uh, referring to coronary artery disease as plaque disease or plaque in epicardial coronary arteries. But uh, over the years, evidence has shown that uh, 
coronary artery disease or myocardial ischemia is not only a, a function of simple obstruction in the epicardial coronary arteries. There is more to it. And this is evidence in the autopsy studies. And this is sometimes seen in uh, the fact that our patients end up having angina even though they have been revascularized. Uh, and also in some of the trials that uh, examine whether there is prognostic benefit or not in revascularization has failed to show a clear benefit over medical therapy. So all of these point to a situation or, or to a syndrome that is more complex and more subtle than we are used to uh, seeing. Uh, and therefore, we need to be aware of these subtleties in order to get the maximum for our patients. As you all know, myocardial ischemia is a complex uh, uh, process. It has many determinants, determinants of myocardial oxygen demand and myocardial oxygen uh, delivery. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail of all of this, but just to illustrate that there are many uh, aspects that can go wrong and many aspects that can decompensate and cause myocardial isch ischemia. The important thing to remember is absence of epicardial coronary stenosis alone will not rule out diagnosis of myocardial ischemia. You can have perfectly normal epicardial arteries and still have uh, myocardial ischemia. And the vice versa is also true. Uh, the presence of coronary atherosclerotic, atherosclerotic obstructions does not necessarily mean someone has uh, a stable angina or chronic coronary syndrome. And this is what I've been alluding to all this time. It's not, we are moving away from a single pathology to a more ischemia centric, more syndromic uh, focus. And um, hence, uh, the need to be aware of uh, the different pathophysiologies, evaluation strategies, and management strategies. Having said that, the vast majority of coronary artery disease still comes because of epicardial coronary artery obstruction. But equally important, there are other phenomena such as microvascular disease and vasospastic angina that uh, cause. Um, uh, ischemia and angina in patients. The second condition is sometimes called ENOCA, where they, where it is, which is referred to as ischemia with non-obstructed coronary arteries. A little bit about microvascular angina, previously known as syndrome X. This can occur in, occur in up to about 40% of our patients coming with angina, and uh, sometimes the symptoms are classic, and uh, occasionally can come with rest pain as well, often seen in females And this is just an illustration of um, the microvasculature being involved. Uh, there is no, uh, uh, we don't really know what the pathophysiology behind this is, but it's seen in certain conditions such as diabetes more often than in others. Um, so I think the pathophysiology remains to be eluded um, as of now. And there's evidence of ischemia during stress testing. And when we do a coronary angiogram or a CT coronary angiogram, there, are, there is normal or near normal coronary arteries. Importantly, there is secondary microvascular angina that can be attributed to other cardiac diseases such as left ventricular hypertrophy caused by hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, uh, hypertensive heart disease or aortic stenosis, and also due to uh, non, um, also due to systemic vasculitis or, or myocarditis and other inflammatory conditions. Bit about vasospastic angina, not very common, occurs in a minority of patients. It's sometimes called prinzmetal angina as well, uh, due to abnormal reactivity of the smooth muscles of the coronary arteries. And there is a specific characteristics such as not being triggered by exercise, occurs at rest, and can be evoked by different triggers and need specific diagnostic tests and therapies. That's an illustration of vasospasm. Okay, what are moving on from the patho pathology and the pathophysiology into the clinical entities? What are the clinical entities that constitute chronic coronary syndrome? You have the common uh, angina patients or the suspected angina patients when you come across them. That's the first category of patients. Then we have patients with new onset heart failure with a presumed coronary artery disease etiology. Then we have patients who have had an acute coronary event and uh, who have then subsequently recovered and con continue to have either symptomatic or asymptomatic post-acute ACS, uh, 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 post -ACS uh, period. So all these patients are then involved, uh, then uh, categorized under the common umbrella of 
chronic coronary syndrome. And also the vasospastic and the microscalangenia that I mentioned earlier. And funnily, with, um, or, or strangely, with more and more asymptomatic, um, uh, with more and more screening that's going on, we get a lot of asymptomatic uh, subjects as well in whom coronary artery disease is detected at screening. So evaluation. What are the subtleties and the nuances in evaluation? It's a stepwise process. The most important step is your history. And I cannot overemphasize the importance of a good history in, in, in clinching the diagnosis. As you all know, depending on the patient's symptoms and its, re and its um, relationship to exertion, we can uh, categorize chest pain as typical angina, atypical angina, or non-cardiac chest pain. Once you have an idea of, uh, one, once you know the history, I'll, I'll come to why the history is very important, especially when you are uh, planning the evaluation or the diagnostic test. Uh, we then go on to the baseline investigations. I'm not going to go into detail about this because for, in, for the interest of time. I'll come directly to the diagnostic investigations. And this is where your history really matters because the diagnostic investigations are multifold. We are we are commonly used to seeing uh, patients or, or clinicians being referred for um, exercise ECG and echocardiogram uh, in almost all the patients who come with chest pain. But this is not always appropriate. And we have to first do uh, assess the patient clinically and de decide on what we call the pre-test probability. And this, that, this is why the history is very important. And the pre-test probability has been derived from uh, multiple trials and studies and so on. And this is the table that's there on the ESC guidelines. And it just shows, it takes into consideration the gender, the age, and the nature of symptoms. So as you can see, the older the patient gets, even atypical or non-anginal symptoms tend to have more serious uh, significance or, or, or more significance and have a higher pretest probability of actually uh, being attributable to uh, coronary artery disease. Same goes for dyspnea. Compared to a younger patient with dyspnea, an older patient with dyspnea has a higher chance of having a coronary artery disease simply because of its background risk. So this is what we call the pretest probability. So this is a very important thing to consider and to be aware of when we are planning the investigations. The diag and, and it is also important to realize that the diagnostic testing is most important when the pretest probability is intermediate. And we consider a pretest probability to be intermediate if the, the risk of or if the probability is around 15% or more. Now, you might ask me that there is why did you consider only age, gender, and the typicality of symptoms? What about the other risk factors such as family history, dyslipidemia, diabetes, hypertension, and then the newer risk factors such as stress and lack of sleep and so on? Yes, those are important as well. And that's why now we talk of what we call a clinical likelihood. So we don't only talk of the pretest prob probability. We don't only utilize that table. We use what we call uh, a clinical likelihood. Uh, and we use that to modify our pretest prob probability and see whether the patients have uh, a significant likelihood of having coronary artery disease. Any, if any of these things are present in the history or in the ECG or the echo, then we try to take the patients even with a pretest probability of 5 to 15% as those with significant likelihood of ischemic heart disease. And then we, our uh, initial choice of test for diagnosing them will differ depending on that. Also, at the same time, if you pay attention to this uh, diagram here, now this is, a, if you take this as a spectrum of uh, chronic coronary syndrome or the possibility of someone having chronic coronary syndrome, at this end, on, on the extreme right, are the patients who are very likely to have uh, ischemic heart disease. And at the other end, on the left side, you'll have patients who, are, who have a very low likelihood of having ischemic heart disease. 
So both these type of patients may present with similar symptoms, but based on their pretest probability and the clinical likelihood that we just discussed about, they will fall into some uh, place within the spectrum. Important thing to realize is patients who are at the extreme ends do not perhaps need a diagnostic test to further uh, to, to confirm the diagnosis. Those who are at very high end high risk or those who are at the very high likelihood can be presumed as having coronary artery disease and go for therapeutic planning diag uh, investigations and, and invasive therapies straight away uh, without depending on a diagnostic test. Likewise, patients who are at the lower, spec lower end of the spectrum will not need a diagnostic test uh, to say that they don't have uh, ischemic heart disease. We can clinically uh, assure them that they do not have ischemic heart disease and that they do not need a uh, further uh, diagnostic test. These are I just mentioned. So if you have high likelihood, you can go for invasive coronary angiogram and plan therapy immediately. And this is the group that is very important and this is the group that constitute most of our uh, subtleties or most of the difficult group to really diagnose or uh, discard the diagnosis. So in these patients, we need to go for non-invasive diagnosis tests to establish diagnosis and to assess the event risk. The importance of uh, identifying this subgroup is to reduce the number of patients who require invasive diagnosis because invasive diagnostic tests would be the gold standard, but not everybody needs it and it has its inherent risks. So, and, and, and for us, if you are good clinicians, we don't need to go directly into that, but we need to choose an appropriate non-invasive diagnostic test in order to establish a diagnosis. And this is where things become a little blurred and this is where your idea of or your appreciation of the subtleties need to be um, uh, improved. Because non-invasive test comes as, uh, comes, can be discussed in mainly two categories, functional imaging and anatomical imaging. And then we had to decide which patient needs functional imaging and which patient needs anatomical imaging because they give different types of information and they are good for certain, I mean, even within the intermediate uh, risk category or the intermediate likelihood uh, uh, group of patients, uh, even within that spectrum, some tests are good at one end and the other tests are good at another end. But whatever test we choose before doing it, we had to always consider the patient's general consider, uh, con condition. If there's an elderly patient who's unlikely to uh, withstand revascularization uh, and uh, if he's unlikely to have a reasonable improvement of quality of life with any of our interventions, then we need not uh, aggressively investigate these patients and we just going to need to minimize further testing and go for uh, non-invasive tests, if at all, if just to verify the diagnosis, but sometimes even that's not needed. You can just start treatment uh, um, with the presumption of coronary artery disease, even though it has not been fully demonstrated. So at the outset, if the patient's therapeutic strategy is not going to be changed by your test, don't test. That's, a, that's the um, uh, take-home message, and you just start them on treatment um, without further burdening them. And the other, uh, the rest of them who are appropriate to be investigated, we are going to discuss about uh, what sort of investigations to choose on them. Now, this depends on what we call a, so there are there are there are patient-related factors and there are investigation-related factors. Uh, the test-wise, you get the uh, you, each test can be um, uh, evaluated with what we call the positive likelihood ratio or the negative likelihood ratio. Uh, I'm not going to go deep into this because this is a bit of a uh, statistical analysis there. But I'll just talk a little bit about this diagram and trying to um, give you an idea about how the positive likelihood ratio or the negative likelihood ratio is useful in your patients uh, in choosing uh, the appropriate test. So that these longitudinal bars are essentially uh, represent, they essentially represent the patient's likelihood of having coronary artery disease or not. A bit like the initial diagram I showed you. So zero means their likelihood is very low, 100% means their likelihood is very high. 
So if you pay attention to the stress CH, CG, coronary angiogram, uh, and the stress echocardiogram, for example, because those are the ones that are commonly available in Sri Lanka, you can say that, you know, the red or the green bars show that at which point in the spectrum can they be used in these patients in order to di make an appropriate diagnosis. Now, the commonly used test in Sri Lanka, the treadmill test or the exercise ECG, has a very narrow uh, spectrum of use. You can use it in patients who are, uh, you know, to, to uh, rule in, in patients who are very likely to have coronary artery disease, but you can't use it much in the intermediate group. And sometimes you can use it to rule out in the patients who are least likely to have coronary artery disease as a rule out test. But the intermediate group is vastly untouched by uh, the treadmill test or the exercise ECG. And even though we widely use it because of uh, wide availability, it's not a good test to identify our patients, uh, the vast majority of our patients who are in this uh, middle segment. So compared to that, you get other functional tests such as a stress echocardiogram. And the stress echocardiogram, you know, you can, as you can see here, uh, uh, can be used in a wider spectrum uh, to both rule in and rule out coronary artery disease. And that is a functional test that we are commonly, that is commonly available again in Sri Lanka, but time consuming and, and needs uh, uh, operator skill. Therefore, it takes, it's not as widely available as uh, exercise CCG. Then there's anatomical imaging, which is, imaging, which is called coronary CT angiography. And if you see here, it, it basically covers the largest spectrum or it has the widest spectrum, widest coverage in, in the entire spectrum. It's a very good test to rule out because it covers from zero to almost up to 70 to 80% of clinical likelihood. It's also good to rule in as well, but perhaps not the best test for rule in uh, for reasons that I will tell you in time to come. But um, uh, you can see coronary CT angiography is, is a test that is most widely used for ruling out in this situation. So this is how we decide on which test to take. You talk, talk about the clinical likelihood of the patient, that's what we discussed earlier, and then you talk the likelihood of the ratio of a particular test, and then together we can discuss, uh, together we can come to a di um, what you call the post-test probability of coronary artery disease before making a final diagnosis. So non invasive tests, um, I should have told you at the beginning, are twofold, anatomical and functional. Anatomical test is a CT coronary angiogram. And this is how a patient undergoes CT coronary angiogram. And this is an example of a CT coronary angiogram. Um, and it is preferred in a patient with a lower range of clinical like coronary artery disease because it's a good test to rule out coronary artery disease. And it's good in patients with no previous diagnosis of coronary artery disease. And it's also appropriate in patients who have uh, good um, uh, physical attributes uh, that makes a CT scan um, feasible in that patient. So it's good to rule out uh, anatomically and functionally significant coronary artery disease, but uh, any coronary stenosis that is about 50 to 90 percent by visual inspection may not be functionally significant, and therefore it is not a good test as a uh, to, to rule in or to. Um, uh, planned therapy. So, so because of these reasons, it's good for ruling out, but not for ruling in. But one good thing about, another good thing about CT coronary angiography is even if you do not have obstructive coronary atherosclerosis, you have, you can get further prognostic information because you get non-obstructive uh, atheroma or plaque disease, and this can provide um, a good uh, stimulus to initiate appropriate preventive therapy. And several trials have supported the use of CTCA. But while at the same time, I'm going to discuss on, uh, on the overuse of CT coronary angiography, because there is also a trend nowadays to use CT coronary angiography and overuse CT coronary angiography, sometimes even in asymptomatic patients, even for as a screening test. There's clearly no evidence uh, uh, that, that has any benefit. Um, and also there could be uh, downsides and negative aspects to, to it because uh, plaque and coronary calcium can occur in many healthy people. It's part of the aging process, if you know, uh, because as we age, all our arteries become more calcified, have plaque developing in them, uh, and a detection of a, a clinically insignificant plaque in a CT coronary angiogram can cause you to have increased worry, 
and can also go in make you take treatment that you really need not have uh, so it takes a high uh, chance of people being started on aspirin and statins and sometimes even going into invasive tests like uh, invasive angiography uh, when you un when you do ct coronary angiography in patients who have no previous or no real indication um, in terms of uh, clinical clinically relevant symptoms some other concerns would be radiation exposure cost and sometimes non-diagnostic image qualities. Going on to the functional tests, they typically have a better rule-in power, like I mentioned earlier. So they are better at the right end of that spectrum. And also when we use a functional test to diagnose a patient, they cause lesser referrals for invasive coronary angiography compared to an anatomical test. Because if you do a functional test, uh, if the functional test is normal, even if you do have symptoms, that gives you a good um, idea of the patient's prognostic um, uh, status, and then you don't need to go for an invasive angiogram because the, the even though he has symptoms, we can manage it medically uh, as uh, patients, uh, as, as the functional test has shown that patient does not have functionally significant uh, atherosclerosis or coronary obstructions. And the other reason why this is good as a, um, at, the, at the top end of the spectrum or in patients who are more likely to have ischemic heart disease is because even if you, even if you detect a coronary lesion, even if you detect an obstruction in the coronary arteries, you have to make sure that this lesion is causing the problem before going ahead and revascularizing this patient. So in order to get that information, all patients who have a, a, a CT coronary angiogram or even invasive coronary angiogram sometimes need a functional assessment in order to assess their, uh, assess the, their lesions' clinical significance. Therefore, uh, functional tests are almost always the choice, uh, test of choice in patients who have previously diagnosed coronary artery disease and in patients who are at the higher end of uh, the, uh, the spectrum of uh, uh, clinical likelihood. And this is a pictogram of what I've just been telling you about. And this is just uh, an overview of what the functional tests are. Uh, Non-invasive functional tests are what we talk about. What we have in Sri Lanka mostly is the ECG, uh, or rather the exercise ECG. Uh, but we also can uh, arrange uh, dobutamine stress echo, stress MRI, SPECT, and PET scans. Um, the, these become more and more technical dependent and more expensive. Um, but Robitum is Echo perhaps is a, is a reasonably widely available um, and fairly low cost test that we can use in, in selected patients. Right, so this is just how functional uh, tests detect myocardial ischemia. I detect myocardial ischemia through ECG changes or wall motion abnormalities or perfusion changes. Little technical, I don't think we need to go in deep, deep into that. Um, but just to highlight some limitations, um, as functional tests, while they are very specific and while they are good to rule in disease, they are not good to rule out sometimes because uh, the, they are not the best tests at the lower end of the clinical likelihood spectrum uh, because they are unlike they are unable to assess whether the patient has coronary atherosclerosis or not. They can only say the functional significance. So patients at a lower clinical likelihood, it's better to have a visual assessment uh, using a CT coronary angiogram. And that can also have that advantage of uh, not needing uh, risk charts, et cetera, to initiate uh, secondary prevention therapy. A little bit about exercise ECG. Um, I'm not going to go in detail into this because we need to move on to the nuances in management. Um, so management goals in uh, chronic coronary syndrome or stable ischemic heart disease is twofold, symptomatic improvement and uh, prognostic benefit. And both of these can be achieved with medical therapy and guidelines always recommend uh, using this medical therapy as the first line before moving on to revascularization. What is optimal medical therapy? Therapy that satisfactorily controls symptoms, prevents cardiac events or improves prognosis, has good patient adherence, and has minimal adverse events. Initial anti or initial medical therapy for symptoms uh, 
um, depends largely on the individual patient's profile and comorbidities and potential drug interactions with other ter therapies the patient may be having and then the patient preference and the drug availability locally. Combination therapy with two antianginals versus monotherapy or even three antianginals sometimes. It's not, it's not clear as to which approach is better. Do we start with one drug and then gradually increase or do we start with two or three drugs at once? Doesn't really matter. There is no um, evidence behind it. Uh, we can choose whatever that we think is reasonable and then reassess the patient about two to four weeks to assess the response. The guidelines and the usual practice dictates that we start that, that uh, antianginal therapy is divided as first line and second line. Uh, all the Europe, both the European, American, and the NICE guidelines in the UK mention this. So nitrates, beta blockers, and calcium channel blockers are usual first line medications. Ivabregine, nicarandil, ranolizine, and trimetacetine are considered second line medication. And these are I mentioned. These, these are the guidelines say. But when in real practice, is there actually a therapeutic, therapeutic hierarchy of antianginals? Do we always have to start with the first line drugs first and then move on to the second line? Or can we combine or can we start off with a second line medication? So no head-to-head -head comparisons between first choice and second choice. And there has been no superiority demonstrated over one choice, uh, one uh, strategy over the other. And often, like I said, double or triple therapy sometimes is needed. Uh, to get optimal antianginal benefit. Uh, and the important thing to remember is guidelines do not provide an indication of the optimal combination. So we have to use our clinical sense in, in combining the medications. And that's why that's where uh, the nuances matter again. That's where the subtleties matter again. And let's see what sort of combinations that we can um, uh, design for our patients depending on the comorbidities, risk factors, and the specific pathophysiologies. Before I go into detail, I'm just going to give a rough idea of, um, of the possible combinations of antianginals. These are roughly the most widely available antianginals for us now. And this is sometimes called the diamond approach as well. Um, so if you see the green lines here, the green lines are the combinations that are usually recommended and usually have synergistic effect and therefore can be used widely in our patients. The red lines, are combinations that you should avoid due to side effects. And uh, the blue lines, blue continuous lines, are other possible combinations. <clears throat> and the blue interrupted lines are the lines that uh, are, are the, um, indicate medications that are similar to each other and hence you don't always need to, you can't always use them together. <clears throat> I'm not going to go into details, you all know the pharmacology of these patients. But just a few practical points. Uh, when you're using nitrates, it causes reflex sympathetic activity and causes a bit of tachycardia and sometimes increased myocardial contractility. <clears throat> Therefore, this can offset its antianginal effect. Therefore, it's always good to combine it with a beta blocker to prevent the tachycardia and achieve a synergistic anti ischemic effect. <clears throat> it is not effective in microvascular angina or vasospastic. Uh, it's not effective in microvascular angina. In vasospastic angina, it is beneficial due to its vasodilatory effect. Contraindications, again, I'm not going to go into detail. It's something that most of us know uh, in our daily practice. Beta blockers, again, just to highlight the practical points. Um, so atenolol, metoprolol are cardioselective. Carvedilol, labetilol are beta-1 selective plus alpha blocking. Um, and nebivolol is highly cardioselective and non-selective. We don't use in angina. Beta blockers uh, practically can be combined in dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers and other vasodilating antianginals can be combined with ivabradine but should not be combined with non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, particularly verapamil, due to the risk of bradycardia. You should never abruptly discontinue it due to reflex tachycardia and um, uh, worsening of angina. In vasospastic angina, it won't work and best to avoid it because it precipitates alpha-mediated vasospasm. And in microvascular angina also, there is no evidence that it is helpful. Calcium channel blockers, both non-dihydropyridine and dihydropyridine, they differ in their selectivity for the vasculature versus the myocardium. And um, the non-dihydropyridines act more on the myocardium and the um, uh, SA node and the AV node. <coughs> 
therefore they are better in patients with tachycardias um, and um, uh, and um, uh, rather than uh, the non dihydropyridines rather than the dihydropyridines it is all it's good in vasospastic angina as well um, and uh, the important thing to remember is uh, you cannot combine it with ivabradine because ivabradine and uh, calcium channel blockers are both uh, metabolized in the same liver enzyme and therefore it can cause severe bradycardia. Same thing again. Nicorandil. Um, Nicorandil is uh, now going out of fashion in the Western world, but it's still widely used here. Uh, but, and it has a good antianginal effect. Um, but it has some side effects as well, including oral uh, and gastrointestinal ulceration. Um, so uh, when you're using it aspirin, you have to be a little uh, cautious because that can sometimes cause uh, gastrointestinal ulceration. Ivorbridine has a synergistic eff effect with beta blockers. And in patients receiving beta blockers uh, who are still symptomatic, adding ivorbridine will improve the uh, um, angina and reduce the heart rate further. So if the heart rate is not controlled with uh, a good dose of beta blockers, going to an anti, uh, ivorbridine will give you a better uh, an anginal benefit, anti-anginal benefit than increasing your beta blocker dose. Ranolazine is, uh, has an action on the metabolism uh, at, at the myocardial metabolism level. Therefore, it has a neutral effect on the hemodynamics and the heart rate. And um, it can therefore be used in a wide variety of clinical conditions as well. So this is just a table summarizing all of this. I'll quickly, just to finish off, go through some of the patients, uh, some of the patients that we can have. So if you get a patient with uh, angina with high heart rate, um, so you can use all these medications except for nitrates, dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, and nicorandil because they can reflexly cause a reflex tachycardia. So other than that, you can use all the other medications. In patients with AF, you prefer rate controlling medications. And again, you try to avoid uh, me medications that can cause uh, tachycardia in AF patients. So the, what all the uh, agents in the green circle here are preferable. Uh, in the white circle is second line and uh, ones to avoid or have caution are the ones in the red circle. In bradycardia, again, similar, it's the opposite of that. You uh, avoid heart rate controlling medication and you uh, have a preference for uh, all other medications. In patients with heart failure, you use uh, beta blockers or ivabradine in pref uh, as a first line agents. Uh, you can use uh, ranolazine or um, nitrates as a second line and then you avoid dihydropyridine or non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers and nicorandil. Um, same with hypotension, anything that can cause uh, low blood pressure to be avoided and you can use the other. So hypertension again, same, you can use most um, medications in hypertension. Actually, there's no contraindication at all in patients with hypertension and angina. In diabetic patients, again, um, though beta blockers are seen in red here, most diabetic patients are, uh, can tolerate beta blockers. It's only in patients who are advanced diabetics and who have a risk of hypoglycemia uh, that beta blockers should be used with cautions or avoided because they can um, mask hypoglycemic symptoms. And in patients with peripheral artery disease, Again, no particular contraindications per se, but beta blockers has traditionally been a little um, uh, controversial in peripheral arterial disease. But now with new evidence, even beta blockers can be used unless there is very severe peripheral artery disease. Uh, but um, otherwise, even in mild to moderate disease, you can still use beta blockers in per, uh, angina patients with peripheral artery disease. In patients with COPD, um, uh, except for non-selective beta blockers, all other medications can be used. In microvascular angina, uh, all combinations are, are possible, uh, but the uh, first line would be metabolism altering medications like ranolazine or trimetacidine. Right, so a little bit about microvascular. In vasospastic angina, just avoid beta blockers and you can use all other medications. The vasodilating antianginals will take precedence, others can be used as second line if needed beta blockers to be avoided. Okay, so coming to the end of the presentation, the take home message is that coronary coronary syndrome is a heterogeneous condition. So you have to pay, pay attention to the subtleties. Uh, 
And one way of uh, identifying the subtleties is to take a good history, and that will help you clinch the diagnosis and plan appropriate treatment. Uh, diagnostic investigations depend on the clinical likelihood, and management of um, uh, the patient depends on uh, the comorbidities, the risk factors, and the underlying pathophysiology. So if you know uh, all these, uh, that will give you a, a good uh, idea in how to manage the patients, and I'm sure your patients will benefit a lot. A special thank you to the College of Physicians, Sri Lanka College of Cardiology, Dr. Nirmali Amarasena, who suggested the topic uh, to be discussed today, and my uh, trainers, Dr. Gota Biran Singh and Dr. Shantara, Dr. Chandra Kapoor and Dr. Aruna Gunabala. And last but not least, to all my patients and colleagues uh, for helping me improve as a clinician and to um, get me to this stage. Thank you very much. Right. <clears throat> thank you, Amar. Uh, since we've gone over time, I think we will avoid questions. May I? It's my great pleasure to present this certificate of appreciation from the Ceylon College of Physics. Right. Uh, thank you. Then uh, my thanks to, uh, as the president, uh, to. Dr. Mayuradhan, who joined us uh, to chair this session, the judges of the Young Physicians Forum, Professor Kamani Vanikasuri and Dr. Opul Disanayake, Dr. Tamal Mitanage, who did the college lecture today, to Preeti and Nilanga for doing the uh, Young Physicians Forum, and of course the audience, both online and in person. Thank you very much for joining. This will be a monthly event, so join us next week as well. And in addition to that, we have a number of other activities lined up. We will keep you posted via our Facebook page or via our, uh, we'll have the Instagram account also up and running uh, with all this information. So please join us in the future activities. Thank you very much. Have a pleasant day. Thank you.